The following is a 5 for 2 production. Welcome to episode R of Ticket Stubs. It, it is amazing. We have made it here. Todd, I kind of start each show out this week, but it is. Each week is like just amazing to me. I kind of feel like Nikki Six back in the 80s. You never know if I'm going to make it to the next episode. You know, so. Right, right. I'm happy, uh, I'm happy to be here with everybody. So I'm hoping you're all enjoying the series. Uh, I, I think maybe maybe we might get an extra visit from Dad in this episode, depending on if we can get him away from the Biden debate thing going on right now. <laughs> the Bakers but, are becoming uh, regular uh, characters here on the show. I think I Dad's going to be huge. He's going to be like a viral yeah. success on the internet. Love it. I think um, next season, you know, when you move on to just doing what the hell was that again, I'm going to have your dad just on here and, you know, he can there tell you me about all There you go. He's going to tell stories. Exactly. You know, he can do it. I, I, once, once the Dodger season is over, he's got nothing else to do. So you know. I would gladly give your dad a podcast. You know, if, if we could get him, a, if we could get a mic in front of him for a, a half hour a week, man, that would be awesome. So Stories right next to the lazy boy, right next, you know, right, right in front of the TV, he can watch Judge Judy and Doctor <laughs> Phil while he does the show. That would be great. Yes, indeed, indeed. All so right, Todd, so Todd, we got a big, we got. Night. Yeah, I got a big episode here. Yeah. This one might be, be kind of long. Not as long as next week's going to be, but we'll talk about that later. That's, that's why I got a backup beer, just in case. So, you know. <laughs> right on, right on. All I'm, right, let's, let's, just go, let's, start at, let's start at the top. I, I, okay. I'm pretty sure you and I have both seen this band one time and one time only, and both on the same tour. So, Rage okay. Against Machine. Ah, yes. Um, uh, now, Lollapalooza 93 is when I saw them. Uh, 96 is when I saw them. Oh, okay. Uh, yeah, I didn't see that tour. If you recall, we talked about that show, which we're also going to talk about in this episode when we get around to the Ramones. But I had well, Devo. That's why I brought it up. Gotcha. I had Devo uh, on that, for that show, for Lollapalooza 96. Oh, uh, okay. I saw Rage Against the Machine at Lollapalooza 93 when they were the opening act on the main stage. And uh, Zach... Uh, De La Roca tried to uh, start a uh, riot with the police uh, there that day. Uh, but back then, Buckeye Lake used a lot of uh, uniformed uh, Licking County Sheriff deputies as the security. And he uh, he, he kind of looked out at the crowd and he's like, see all these cops walking around here? Well, you don't have to listen to a goddamn word they say, you know. And then he told this story about how I guess the cops in Tennessee yesterday had busted all of the, like, weed booths. All the, like, any of the booths at the festival selling, like, you know, bowls or lighters or paraphernalia and stuff. Right. So, uh, anyway, that was kind of funny. And it was just kind of funny to watch these cops stand there and look at him, you know, like, what, what's this guy trying Really? To all right, we can take your ass to jail right now. You can go see what Licking County prison looks like, pal. And I also, what was weird about that, I also remember um, Brad Wilkes, their drummer, uh, he, for whatever reason, he played with his back to the crowd and had a big, like, uh, like a big dresser mirror in front of him so he could, like, see the crowd, but yeah. he maybe, himself. maybe he already fucking hated Zach by that time and couldn't stand to look at him during the show, so <laughs> he catches back to him, I don't know, but, but all right. anyway. All right, so, so uh, all right, we got another quick R, Bonnie Raitt. You ever see Bonnie Raitt? I have not seen Bonnie Raitt. She's like a ga – it's a gaping hole in my concert history. Uh, so so I, I'm glad I got I, – I can say – I think that was at like at a jazz fest or, you know, somewhere mm -hmm. along the lines. But I I, ha I can say I've seen Bonnie Raitt. She's I another have, one of those kind of cheap trick, uh, you know, she's in that like cheap trick area where, you know, you might catch her on someone else's show, you know. Right. If you're lucky like that. Well, and, you know, if you know anything about Bonnie Raitt's history, she kind of, you know, came up with Little Feet in L.A., uh, late 60s, early 70s, did a lot of backup work, did her own solo stuff, toured with Jackson Brown in the early 70s, uh, was on Warren Zevon's first solo record. So, I mean, she's always had her, you know, her fingers with, you know, in, in other people's pies. Uh, in good ways, you know. I mean, <laughs> right, 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 right. But, uh, all right, so let's get to the main, let's get to the big R. Come on. Okay, you know uh, all right. Uh, well, no, I have, uh, you know, a few honorable mentions here. Let's, uh, you know, go through uh, R.E.M. Have you ever seen R.E.M.? Oh, yeah, but uh, we're, we're in the R.A.'s. Oh, okay. Uh, I, I, okay, I, okay. I, all right, all right, all right. Well, um, 
I, I had to put a few over here on my side notes so they got a little out of the alphabetical order. All right, so they, alphabetically, they uh, I lived in Athens, Georgia, <laughs> uh, and uh, you know, and you and I are both big drive-by truckers fans, dude. I, I, I've I've stood next to Mike Mills at the Forty Watt Club at a trucker show before. Mm. Uh, you know, didn't well, bother the guy; just I left him alone. But I, mean, I just you know. saw three out of four of the REM members with drive-by truckers last uh, September, about a year ago, exactly um, from when we're taping this. Um, they did the uh, fabulous Fox uh, Theater revival, mm. and they were the surprise guests. Uh, the uh, uh, Barry, Bill Barry, was billed on the you know he was actually advertised. It was like Bill Barry and friends. Right. Well, his friends were uh, Mike Mills and uh, Peter Buck. Peter and Buck. I just remember after the uh, Kevin Kenny from uh, Driving and Crying who hosted the whole event. He was like a, a hog in heaven because he got to sing like the kind of the two biggest REM hits with him. Um, I think Fall on Me and uh, where, where the hell was Michael Stipe? He was too busy to show up. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I, I guess too too good for that event. Couldn't help out the theater. But yeah. uh, after the show, I shook my I shook Peter Buck's hand. Uh, we were walking back to our car, and boom! All of a sudden, the, this backstage door opens, and out walks Peter Buck uh, with a direct line to DBT's bus. And I was just like, you know, good show, sir. So. That was pretty cool. Now, my original, my first REM show, um, let's see, it was June of 1995. That's You've this seen is more the, than once. I've seen them. I well, if you count last year as seeing them, yes. But la I actually saw REM once on the Monster Tour without Bill Berry. So I've seen, you know, the three without Stipe, and I've seen the other three, you know, REM as REM without Barry. And now that you mention that, I you know I'm wondering if I saw the all four members because when I saw them, it was with uh, Springsteen and John Fogarty up in Cleveland. What year? Do you know what year? I'd have to look it up. It was well, no, actually, no, I don't because it was the year John Kerry was running for president. Uh, okay, yeah, then Barry wouldn't have been with him. Uh, you know, he quit around '94 or so. But um, that's what I mean. He wasn't on this tour, um, heart issues or whatever. But uh, this was. The, the well, didn't he have a brain aneurysm or something? That's what it is. That's what it is. Yeah, it was like a, a blood issue. Yeah, exactly. It was a brain aneurysm, not heart. But um, I remember this was the first ticket I bought six months in advance of the show. Now it's kind of common. Sometimes you'll buy tickets nowadays for a show in a year in advance. Yeah, it depends. I'm, you know, I'm and I'm sitting. Well, if you're if it's like the Aussie or any of these shows, this the Aussie tour where he postponed it twice, or any tour this year. You know, you might be sitting on tickets for well over a year. But um, this was like six months in advance. I remember just being like, God damn it, I got to shell out money for this fucking concert six months in advance. Oh, you're gonna fucking see it. So, all right, I got a, I got a few other ras okay we yeah we can we can circle back to that because i do have some ras here as well myself real real quick to rat and rat dog well i have rat dog uh, i have a, a few rat Ever stories rat? so rat uh, oh my god dude uh, look here have i seen rat have i seen rat rat okay. all right rat is like poison warrant and tesla they mm -hmm. all toured together several times in different variations. So if you saw, I mean, dude, there were there were there was one year where I saw Poison with Warrant, and three months later saw Poison and Rat. <laughs> you know? I saw I saw Poison with Rat. Uh, my third uh, Rat show. I'm going to double back to number one and two, but um, my third Rat show was at the Ohio Center. Um, That's when I met him. Oh, okay. No, wait, no, wait. No, that was 87. No, was I, the, I, I met him in 89. Okay, this is 87. This was Look What the Cat Dragged In tour, and uh, it was Dancing Undercover for Rat. Rat's really last arena tour. No, now, no, I, no, I saw him with, with uh, Kix and with Brittany Fox at the Ohio Center in 89. Okay. That was right around the end of their arena tour days right Okay, there. okay, okay. Uh, well, you know, it definitely wasn't their heyday of the first two shows I was going to show you. So... I saw them there. If you see, uh, I'll look at those dates. One of those is for Charleston, West Virginia, where we've talked about many times on this show. And another is for Huntington, mm -hmm. West Virginia, later on the same tour. Um, as I mentioned, Rat had Poison open for them on the, the third time I saw them, who Poison obviously went on to be a much bigger band. The opening act for these two shows was this band. Um, they never really made it very big. Bon something, Bon Jovi. Bon Jovi. I've oh, that's the, it. Those guys. Yeah, whatever happened to those guys? So. Well, I, I guess his uncle was a producer in Jersey or something. He started up just like cleaning up puke and jizz in the, uh, <laughs> you know, 
in, in the studio. I, I guess he recorded a couple hits, I guess <laughs> you could call them. Uh, but uh, they've been around for a little while, dude. I think they're still playing. Uh, I'm pretty sure. Right on, right on. So, yeah, it's good to see, you know, Rat could, you know, help out these struggling bands. And yeah. I don't think yeah. the favor's ever been repaid. <laughs> I got to say, look, if, if you haven't seen the Geico ad where the guy says, well, we have a little bit of a rat problem, dude, you look it up on, you know, on YouTube. It's fucking funny. Uh, I had to explain it to my dad a couple times why why it's funny, but uh, but still, I, I thought it was hilarious. Way to go, Geico. So, uh, yeah, I, I love so, that. I'm not going to buy your shitty product, but I, I, I think, you know, some of your ads are good. And then I didn't see Rad again for many years. I, I saw uh, Stephen Piercy solo uh, in two. That doesn't even need to be mentioned. We can just oh, move along. Well, I have to mention it because of the venue. Now they've since torn this place down. I don't know if it's indicative of the name, but it's so in a place called Whiskey Dicks. <laughs> There's a place you want to go uh, get I, you. You know, I think I've been to that country ass <laughs> fucking bumpkin bar. Uh, that it wasn't. That was in Columbus, right? Yeah, it was up uh, up on 161. It's just a, a green patch of grass now. It so. was a, that was a shit kicker's kind of place. Shit and then I saw, then I finally saw the triumphant return of Rad on the Infestation tour, where they actually were headlining uh, venues the size of the LC again. And now yeah. they're probably back down to playing places like Whiskey Dicks. <laughs> but uh, well, I don't know. The Geico commercial probably helps them book a few things, you know, these days. So. Well, well, all right. So now, what's rat your rat is, history? Rat is one thing. Rat dog is another. Rat <laughs> dog is just basically Bob Weir without Jerry and the rest of the band. So, and now I guess you know, poor Rob Wasserman. I didn't really. He passed away a couple of years ago. I didn't mm -hmm. really realize that. Yeah, but, um, uh, I saw Rat Dog open for the Black Crows once. That's, uh, that'd be a good. That'd be a good weed smoking kind of day. It's pretty good. Uh, uh, Bobby was wearing his uh, jorts, his cut off jorts. You know, he looked uh, real classy. Bye bye. That's yeah, Bob, Bob's looking more on. like uh, Santa Claus now. Yeah, he was kind of taking on the Jerry Santa vibe at that. that yeah, that, that yeah. Point. But uh, yeah, but I mean, again, uh, you know, once Jerry was gone, uh, that those were your options. You had Rat Dog, you had Phil and Friends, then there was Further, then The Dead, then now Dead and Company, and you know, it's been going. It, it'll <laughs> keep going until they're all fucking dead. But uh, I mean, you know, it's, it's and then like, and then like John Mar Mayer will continue, you know, the tradition right. or whatever, you know. So, so yeah, it, well, you know. There will always be some kind of Grateful Dead music out there on the road. I, I sure, but again, but again, as Warren Zevon once said, if you haven't, you know, you haven't lived if you haven't swung with the dead. So you know, uh, <laughs> right, but, right, uh, right. All right. So um, here's a here's an honorable mention I wanted to mention. Uh, honorable mention I wanted to mention. I just dropped in to see what condition my condition was in. Um, you know, I'm a big wrestling fan. So uh, WWE, WWE Raw. I've been to a few. Uh, WWE Raw. I've events. been to a couple with you as well. Yeah, actually, we've been to a SmackDown together. I was going to save that for next week because I actually have a, a story about the, the SmackDown show we went to that you probably don't even – it won't even occur to you. So we'll save that for next week. All right. We'll, ha we'll work that into That's the – That's one of the 57 topics we right, have. Right, the Mega show. S episode. We'll talk about that in a little while. I mentioned, uh, I mentioned a few episodes ago in the ends when we were talking about Night Demon at Satan's Den, Raven. Seen Raven uh, at Satan's Den. So, right. uh, <laughs> also saw Raven. This is a funny Raven story, real quick. They opened the first time I ever saw Wasp. The best kind of Raven stories. It is. It is. It, and it's quick. It's real quick. If you didn't interrupt me, sure, let's stretch this. Uh, let's stretch this episode out to two hours. You Why want, not? You're talking <laughs> goats. Your time. <laughs> anyway, they opened the first time I saw Slayer, who were also playing the middle spot for Wasp. Poor Wasp and poor Raven. I mean, it just was ridiculous. The the crowd chanted Slayer, Slayer the entire time. Raven were smart. I think they probably had six songs on their set, and they did not stop between songs, you know. They just fucking the Slayer shit and get out of here. So. Anyway, I told, them, I told them about that years later, and they're like, oh, yeah, it was, you know, when I saw them at, the, at Satan's Den. <laughs> and uh, that's, like, that's like Watershed having to open for ICP. You know. I, I still don't know how that show, that show got booked, but maybe we'll ask him. Uh, uh, Todd, Todd, today, I confirmed it. We'll see. We're at least going to get the drummer of Watershed. I, I, don't know about, I, I don't know about Colin. We're, we're still working on Colin, but we we're definitely going to have Herb Shook. Colin's shoot. not going on the show. Her, Herb Shook will be on the show for our W episode, so we can... Uh, we can ah, look, at least we got the drummer. <laughs> All right, so moving on uh, to another... Uh, the big R A. Come on, R A M O N E S. <laughs> Ramones, motherfucker. Ramones, baby. Now, Todd, we've kind of told this um, 
story a couple times. On this story here. needs to be told. This this was this one this one's meant to be in the book. This could be a movie. This this is, told this is properly. This is one of those stories that just never gets old. Now I don't have a stub for this show, but I do have a quick story. I'll tell my part of the getting to the show, and then you can uh, pick it up. We, from didn't, there. we didn't have. We were on the guest list. Exactly. Um, I was um, just getting into the Ramones at the time. Uh, our friend Mike Lecky had uh, kind of turned me on to him, and I remember. And you were working <laughs> with him. Oh yeah, uh, you better get that checked out. Could be COVID. That's <laughs> uh, just that's just two packs of reds a day. There you go. Um, but. You, uh, my kind, uh, my kind friend, uh, you worked at QFM at the time, and you actually got me tickets on the guest list. I remember coming home, and uh, Steve Dury, rest in peace, my roommate at the time. He's like, uh, he looked at me with this disdainful look on his face. He's like, Todd Baker just called, and said you have tickets for the Ramones at the box office of the Newport. Why are you going to see the Ramones? <laughs> he, he just, he didn't understand, didn't get it. But uh, uh, you know, Steve was a bit country. So I was excited. I was really excited. I get to the show. I, I couldn't find you beforehand, but I, I soon saw you uh, after the, uh, the the Ramones set started. Uh. <laughs> no, 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 no. We, we we had a we had a couple pitchers of beer. Oh, okay. Did I meet up with you beforehand? Oh, okay, good. There you go. See the, those foggy memories. I tell you. So then that the, those couple pitchers of beer then. Well, see, folks, Kevin doesn't drink a lot. He, he doesn't today. He didn't. He didn't back then. That that's how Kevin got laid, and I didn't. I uh, usually so, have a beer while we're uh, taping, so. <laughs> so yeah, so uh, so Kevin met me at the Newport again. Now, our, being being that I I just started working at QFM. Like, this was this was uh, somewhere late '88, and I, I I had worked as a free intern the end of my freshman year at the beginning of '88. Went home to Pennsylvania for the summer, and then came back my sophomore year uh in september of 88 and at that point they had a paying job for me i was actually getting paid to do radio research five bucks an hour with sue wiggins god bless her and um but you know but also kept the free internship going which kept me rolling and free cds and you know and free tickets and that sort of thing and and god bless my buddy munch mark munch bishop so i gotta throw it out there my buddy mark munch bishop if you don't know who munch is munch is a radio legend in Columbus, Ohio, and and actually still is quite active up in the Cleveland area, from what I understand. So, uh, so God bless you, Munch. Hope you and your family are well. It's been a long, long time since I've seen you, pal, but I still think of you often and think of you fondly. So, uh, you, you 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 taught me well, oh, master. <laughs> so, uh, so anyhow, so I bugged Munch for a month to get me these Ramones tickets, and finally, you know, he he made the deal. He made it happen. He, you know, he, he said, look, you got a plus one waiting for you at the Newport. I'll see you there. So, as Kevin was saying, you know, he, I, I called him. I said, I got an extra for you. Just meet me at the show. Now, I came completely unprepared clothing-wise for a Ramon show. I was wearing, like, a Grateful Dead tie-dye. I, you know, I had shorts on. I had, you know, a little Doc Sider, you know, shoes. You know, everyone else is wearing black, black leather black black blackity black blacker than black and uh, you yeah, know now it's a fashion statement the ramones shirt with the logo but back then you know the, the back then it was, fans, it was a cult you know. right it was exactly. a cult uh so i'm not not prepared <laughs> at, at all for this type of crowd and so kevin and i proceeded to have a couple pitchers of beer for the show and and that's and so why i don't was, remember uh, seeing you before the show that's all right. So that's all right. So Kevin now actually had, now it's coming back to me. I think I may have even helped you. Uh, Kevin had been to a few of these rock shows before, where there might be some slam dancing or some mosh pits or, gosh, maybe even some stage diving. And I I had never experienced anything like this in my young concert going years, and so Kevin was more than happy to introduce me to this lifestyle that he had embraced. Uh, and got me right down front there for the Ramones, and I, I can't remember. That. There must have been an opening act, but the I Dickies, no idea. the Dickies, a classic uh, punk band, actually. Uh, Joey Ramone. I remember the first time I ever saw Joey Ramone live was him standing on stage watching the entire Dickies set. Like, no, 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 there's Joey. He's gonna come out here and sing. Well, jo Joey will come back into the story here in just a moment. 
But uh, so anyhow, so now Kevin's heard this story many times. He was there to witness it. He he could verify every word I'm about to tell you. Uh, so the Ramones come on first song. I, I have no idea. I, I'd have to look up the set list, but uh, you know we are literally right in front of Joey Ramone. Probably Durango '95 into Warthog into the teenage go. lobotomy. Probably. So now there is a a barrier between the crowd and the Newport stage so that security guys can walk in between and drag people out or throw them back in or whatever the case may be. And so, you know, Kevin gets up, jumps over the barrier, onto the stage, does his thing, woo, jumps right back off. Dude, amazing. Had never seen anything like that in my life. Now, the guy next to me looks at me and says, do you want to go up? Sure, I want to go up. Now, Look, I'm wearing sunglasses right now. At the time, I was wearing regular glasses uh, and needed them badly because my vision's horrible and still is. And so now the guy helps me up. I lean over the barrier, glasses come off into the barrier. I said, wait, stop, ah, stop, not too late. Shoves my ass up on stage. I lose a shoe in the pit. And I'm lying on my back of the Newport as I, as I stand up. I swear to Christ, and Kevin's right there to witness this. I'm standing right next to Joey Ramone. Right next to him. Right, right, right like we are right now. Joey! <laughs> What's up? Now, I'm looking at him like he's my best friend, and he's been waiting for me to give me a hug. And Kevin is in the crowd. Cheer, Todd, come on. Let's Todd, Todd to jump. We got to jump, jump now, and jump. And I did not jump. I see the jump. security approaching Todd from behind. These two I, did not, I did not see the two security guys. Oh, you didn't. I, I did. Kevin did. <laughs> so did Munch, who was sitting on the uh, sidelines there of the Newport. <laughs> I just walked in watching this whole. I mean, this is the first song. Uh, you know, first fucking song, two security guys, boom, out the goddamn door. No glasses, one shoe. I'm already drunk. Uh, I look like the most pitiful homeless person walking down High Street uh, back to my apartment that night. I, I got out of my way. I, I, I couldn't see where I was. I could, was walking with a limp. I clearly smelled of alcohol. Now, uh, you know, again, the sad part is this was the first song I got thrown out of. It would be one thing if I got thrown out at, like, the end of the show. That'd be okay. But, you know, the first song? So, now – Happy, happy end of the, of the story. I, you know, I got to see the Ramones three or four That's months. That's what I was going to ask you. Did you ever get a makeup? And so it's not like I blew the one and only chance I got to see the Ramones. <laughs> and I had a new nickname at work the next day. I walk into work and one says, hey, Slick, how you doing? <laughs> so for like two years, I, I was called Slick. So, you know. You can ask Rob Walker about that. He can verify it. So. Oh, man, dude, that is great. Okay, so thank you to Mark Munch Bishop mm. for getting us the tickets. At least Kevin saw the whole damn show. I saw but, the whole damn show. Uh, Munch, it- Munch, you gave me a great story to pass on uh, and, uh, and, and a wonderful addition for the book. So God bless you, buddy. Hope you're doing well up in Cleveland. And uh, let's, uh, let's, let's, let's do lunch soon, pal. Cheers, so, cheers to Munch. Uh, it led to a lifelong, uh, a lifelong love affair between me and the Ramones. Um, saw him many times again at the Newport in '91. Yep. Uh, I know you were at this show, I think, uh, with Social Distortion at the Newport. All right, now I'm going to save that story for the W's. Okay, okay, I- and I'll tell you why. Okay, because there was there was another band playing in Columbus that night. Gotcha. Okay. Sounds good. Uh, I, I I won't uh, I won't call her out, but a good friend of ours um, we've mentioned on the show a few times, uh, but I won't call her out on this story. <laughs> she got very uh, very inebriated during the Ramones and the Social Distortion show. I don't think she remembers much of the show. I remember taking her home. It was a bit like the um, Animal House, uh, you know, take the you know take the girl home in the shopping cart kind of thing, you know. Except she's a friend of mine. Nothing, nothing no hanky panky went on. Did you have a little devil on your shoulder? <laughs> no, no, not, not, not at all, not at all. Anyway, uh, then uh, when I when I moved out to Arizona, Todd, uh, they were actually, it sucked because you know how much I love Pearl Jam. Uh, I had already moved there and the show was already sold out. And back then I didn't, you know, I wasn't the I wasn't the guy that went down and tried to get the tickets. So I actually missed the Pearl Jam show that year there in Phoenix, and Ramones were the opening act, but. 
I had seen really? them. Yeah, yeah. I had seen them about a month. I'd before. go to see Pearl Jam if Ramones were the opening act. Well, I had seen them about a month before at a place called the Party Gardens, which is a really cool place in Phoenix. I don't know if they do this today. Probably months. not because it's 30 years later. But back then, they separated the drinkers from the non-drinkers. So the front area, it was an outdoor venue, and the front area was like there was like a fence between. So if you weren't drinking, you had to stand in the back. And if you're old enough to drink, you could be up front and just that it was pure chaos. As it should be. If you're exactly. not drinking, get the fuck out of the way. Right, exactly. Unlike what was it, uh, Mr. Smalls, the place we went to for the DBT, it was the opposite. They made you stand in the back if you were drinking. It's like, what the right. what the fuck? You know, I wanna have my beer by the stage. But I just remember Joey announcing the Pearl Jam show at this show, and the crowd like just was like, boo. And Joey got pissed off. He's like, hey, they invited us. We said yes, <laughs> <laughs> and then and, and then we I, the money. <laughs> hey, they're gonna pay, they're gonna pay a big fucking check. I uh, I have my second remote show. I actually have some pictures and a short story about this, but I'm gonna do. I'm gonna skip ahead to my final remote show because we've mentioned this before, and we mentioned it early in the show when you asked if I saw Rage Against the Machine on this tour. All right, loose ninety six. I talked about this already, so I can make it short in the Metallic episode, but that was my final Ramones show and also my final Soundgarden show. But during the Ramones set, you can actually go on YouTube and, and look this up and, and watch it for yourself, folks. The, it was an open-air venue, and there was no backdrop behind the Ramones. You told me about this. Off in the distance, in the desert, you just see this dust cloud. It was like the Tasmanian Devil, except just, you know, giant. And it just kept getting closer closer and closer joey skinny ass joey ramon is like hanging on to his mic and you know his leather jacket and t-shirt are blowing the ramones they tried to hang in there but they finally hightailed off the stage when one of the amps literally came loose from the back line and like rolled across the stage and like almost knocked you know uh, cj over <laughs> so Joey's like we're out of here see you later but uh, you i think they were playing um i'm trying to think uh I don't want to walk around with you or something. You could, like I said, you can go on YouTube and look that up. Just look up like right. Ramones, Dust Storm, Phoenix, 97. Well, again, they're just another example, folks. Uh, look, if you never saw the Ramones, you fucking missed out, man. There's there's just no other way around it. And uh, it doesn't even matter if you saw the Ramones in the old, you know, like, you know, Fat Elvis days. Uh, right. You know, the Ramones are the fucking Ramones. I am lucky, and you're lucky, I guess. You got to see one song, but Dee Dee was still the bass player for that He was show, still the so. bass player. I got to see Dee Dee right as the security guys dragged my ass. And that's literally, the the, that's literally the last time he played with them. He was off the tour soon after that, because that was the tour for Brain Drain, and CJ's in all the videos for that. So yeah. that was like a the switchover happened right there. But what I was going to talk about was my second remote show here, and it's not really a major story. Um, other than the fact that um, one of our friends baptized Mike Ledke's uh, car by fire that day by throwing up in it on the way to the show. <laughs> so you were but telling me he actually set it on fire. I want to talk about the, uh, the Escape from New York tour. This was at the Capital City Music Center, which we've talked about a couple of times. Which is I don't know if I, I don't think I, I don't. You went to other shows that summer, so I'm, I'm surprised. Lonnie and uh, Lonnie right? and the Tom Tom Club, which is um, the um, Talking Heads without David Byrne. What year was that? Uh, 1990, um, 90. 1990, July 16th 90. of 90. Um, but here, here's a, this is a, a Ramones crew right there. Look at those. Nice. <laughs> There's long-haired me there and. I think that's I think that's Led I'm, Key I'm and just more impressed with the Lemmy short cut off uh, jean pants. Uh, yes, thank you, thank you. Uh, have you ever heard the story from uh, Scott uh, Ian about oh, the, yeah. those are sh those aren't uh, shorts, uh, Scott? Uh, those are pants. These are shorts. There's uh, These are shorts. there's me wearing the pinhead mask. And nice, our buddy Mike. Gabba, uh, Gabba, Gabba, hey. There's Debbie Harry. Since uh, we already missed uh, B for Blondie, um, and let's see, here's some Ramones. You can yeah, tell I these never, are. I don't. I never saw Blondie. You can tell these are from the front row. There's a security guard. Right there. You Excuse go. me. Excuse Clear me. Clear as day. <laughs> <laughs> right. Exactly. And then there's CJ. That's a good shot. Yeah, CJ. So anyway, that was a fun one. You know, that was a fun one. Outdoor. So outdoor. all right. So who, who do you, who do you think was the biggest asshole of the group? Oh, Johnny. 
I mean, <laughs> I mean, but no, no question, no question. But if you read anything about him, they kind of needed him to be an yeah. asshole. You know, if they didn't yeah. have Johnny being an asshole, they would have just probably imploded early on. And oh yeah, yeah, that, yeah. Uh, I'm, I'm sure. Uh, you know, but it was always great to watch them go on Howard Stern, and Howard would try to get them to just look at each other. Those guys honestly could be in a band together all those, all those years, and honestly hate one another. But didn't it all stem back to a woman? Like, didn't like, yeah, uh, Johnny, Johnny. Well, Johnny's, Johnny's wife stole, used Johnny to be Joey's stole, girlfriend. Uh, a Joey's girlfriend. That, that's like where the KKK took my baby away. Took my baby from. away. Yeah, that's yeah, that's, uh, so. Hey, and and Todd. Hey, we've got to give credit to Joey and uh, Johnny. The, their friendship lasted. You know, well, they didn't. They actually, I guess, didn't like each other, but they managed to keep a band together despite their political differences. So. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, Johnny wouldn't even go to Joey's funeral. I know, I, I, God, yeah. man, Cole. Like, well, and, you know, and I tell you what, I gotta respect the guy's answer uh, because it's like, well, look, uh, I, I didn't like him when he was alive, and I, I'd be a dick if I showed up at his funeral. So, exactly, you know? exactly what I was gonna say. But uh. <laughs> anyway, all right, let's move on to the R E. Back to the R E S. We already okay. R E M. Yep, yep. R E O. Yes, R E O. Speed O again. Come on, man. Uh, you know, riding a storm out. Uh, you know, I mean, Jesus. Uh, you know, Hell 157 yeah. Riverside Avenue. Uh, you know, uh, don't let him go. Uh, you know, I, I keep on loving you. The hits keep on coming, man. I, I, they, they were, look, they did shitty videos, but they, they had some great songs. Uh, <laughs> I, uh, I just had earlier, I had the um, first four hours playlist of, oh, my gosh, I've got it right here. REO Speedwagon in the first four hours of MTV. Let's 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 do this. In the first four hours when MTV went on the air, you know, with Video Kill the Radio Star, mm -hmm. REO Speedwagon was played one. Two, what was the second song? Pat Benatar. Yep, Pat Benatar, uh, You Better Run. Uh, yep. REO Speedwagon was number nine, was the ninth song with Take It on the Run live um, from that Saturday night concert. They were the first Saturday night concert. Uh, the very first week of MTV, the Saturday Night go. Concert was... Did you ever see the movie wagon. FM? I did not. There's one I need to put on my list. All right, put that on the... Because I because our Aria Speedwagon does a great... They're, they're doing an in-store at Tower Records on Sunset in L.A. Okay. And, and now that Tower Records, of course, is no longer there anymore. I mean, the building's still there, but there's nothing inside and you can't go in. Uh, but it, that's a cool little piece of, of rock and roll history. Do you and, watch? Uh, oh, go ahead. I'm sorry. Do you, do you watch uh, Ozark on Netflix? No. Okay. There, there's an episode of that. I figured you might watch it since you got you tried to get me into um, what was the Jason Bateman show? I had I had it for a while. Oh, uh, Arrested, Arrested Development. Development. Yeah. Um, but anyway, um, there's an episode of Ozark dedicated completely to Ario Speedwagon. They book Ario Speedwagon at the casino for some kind of a money laundering scheme or something. But it's cool. Yeah, that, that, that's pretty much where Ario Speedwagon has been since about <laughs> 1985. Is on the casino, you know, fair circuit. What's Pretty funny much. is uh, I yeah. pulled out. I, I think they, they've toured more with sticks. That's exactly uh, what I was just going to say. I, I pulled out two Ario Speedwagon uh, stubs when I was going through just tonight, just at random, and they're both I mean, with they, sticks. They might as well just combine bands and, mm -hmm. you know, and, and save themselves some money. <laughs> yeah. Just get, I, like, it's Kevin, it's Kevin Cronin, uh, you know, JY and, and Tommy Shaw, and they'll just hire like three other hacks to play like <laughs> bass and guitar for both <laughs> Right. That's probably what will happen someday, Todd. We, we'll see what happens. All right. So, but, uh, so uh, now I know you – oh, say what? The replacements. The replacements. The yes, I did see the replacements once at the Newport. Uh, it was probably the same time you saw them. Probably about the same time. Right. I right. think the only really the, – the only good song off Let It Be They Played that night was Answering Machine. Mm -hmm. uh, because to be honest, folks, uh, the only – replacements record i've ever really liked is let it be sorry uh you know like all the other ones tim and, and please meet me and blah blah whatever uh, there, there, there's maybe there's maybe two other good replacement songs uh left of the dial and bastards of young and and, and other than those two there's really other than that that's 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 the only replacement songs i ever really liked I wasn't. I I know when I saw him, I wasn't a huge fan. I was just like, I gotta see. I, I should go see this band. Kind it's, of. A it's thing. it's one of those things. You know, if you can say, it's like saying you saw a big star. Right. Uh, you know. Right. But uh, exactly. Alex Chilton. Exactly. Um, but, uh, what about? Uh, I know. Uh, I know you probably haven't seen this band unless you saw them uh, not by choice because I I mentioned them on our P episode and and this uh, it got a distinct this from down. you. But the Red Hot Chili Peppers. 
So you see the chili peppers. I don't think I ever have, and and like I said, not a fan. Personal choice. I the the, la, the last time they played uh, Rock on the Range, and I lived in Columbus. I'm like, fuck the Red Hot Chili Peppers. <laughs> I don't, you know, that's like, I, I even, saw that even with the free ticket and the fact they were in my town, I didn't fucking bother to go see the Red Hot Chili Peppers. So. That's another one. That was a good date. That was a good date show. Went with Heather. Um, you know, the new Chili Peppers, kind of the adult contemporary. I saw the Chili Peppers at their height though uh, on the Blood Sugar Sex Magic tour. They headline. The, I told the story at the first Pearl Jam wow, show I saw, it? yeah, where um, where Eddie did the whole, you know, acrobatic thing, but Chili Peppers headlined that show, and that was when they had the big was that, flaming... Was that the year they had the flaming yes, helmets? Yes, the big flaming torches, so and there you go, that's that's the whole story on the Chili Peppers, you know. That, yeah. so. Look, no, no, no offense, uh, you know, as, as, I, as, I, as I'm writing the book right now, and I'm, I'm far... Far behind in the book as compared to who we are in our podcast right here. I'm still working on the goddamn M stories, all right? I'm still on Motley Crue. Uh, I got Motley Crue and, and Motorhead, and then I can move on to the N's finally. But I, I'm working on Motley Crue right now. And I, now I'm thinking to myself, you know, Motley Crue, they, they, were, they were a good band. They, they weren't phenomenal in any sense. They, they weren't, you know, they, they weren't prolific songwriters. Uh, they had some good hits, uh, you know, some memorable songs. Uh, they... They left a lot of people with positive memories of their high school years that they'd carried into their elderly years. <laughs> so me being one of those people. But um, my, my, my point being is that even though they, they may not be the, you know, the greatest band in the world, mm. you know, seeing a Motley Crue show was pretty fucking sweet. Uh, if you, I mean, Motley Crue took was like was like kiss on steroids i mean G, you know sure gene simmons spitfire nikki six set himself on fire okay i mean you know yeah peter chris's drum set you know elevated fucking tommy lee went upside down and eventually into a fucking roller coaster okay i mean you know how, how we get on motley crew from uh from mario speedwagon i don't know <laughs> We're, I think we're going to save Rolling Stones and Rush for our next segment. But uh, I wanted to mention an REO Speedwagon that we've show that we've teased a couple times that I've teased a couple times in previous episodes, and uh, you don't see, you don't remember. But the only real story about it is REO Speedwagon have played the Ohio State Fair many times, and I think this may have been one of the times they came with sticks. But uh, there was a time when they came to the fair, and, and you called me on the day of the show, and you said, hey, Kev, uh, wh what are you doing? You want to you go see REO Speedwagon at the fair? I'm like, well, sure, I'd love to. You're like, i got to be honest with you. You weren't my, you weren't my first choice. But uh, my, my date, uh, I met a date online, and I went over to, to pick her up, and the house was vacant <laughs> and empty. <laughs> you know, it doesn't surprise me. Uh, but I, I, I can't say I necessarily <laughs> recall. I, I, I thought the story was going to get much, much worse. So no, yeah, no. A, a vacant house. Hey, I can deal with that. Uh, like, I, like I've mentioned a few times about being your date. Uh, I, I just, I don't put out. So that's, uh, you know, the story can't get that bad. by beer. And that's, <laughs> and that's even more important sometimes. And probably so. a corn dog too at the fair and maybe even a ride on the sky lift. That doesn't, that doesn't sound right. <laughs> that doesn't sound right so do you have any other uh honorable mention ours before we uh take a little break and move on to our big headliners i'm, I'm throwing just a few in here okay uh right. paul revere and the raiders oh cool when did you see them saw them with the monkeys okay oh cool that, that, that's cool cool bill don rickles don rickles oh, god bless it. yes god you, bless you, you dummies you know, I, 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 I love that word dummy. It's not an insult to me at all. I, mm. I think dummy should be used on a daily basis. It's, it's not profanity, and it clearly states exactly how you feel about a person. You're a dummy. One of my good, uh, one of my good friends, uh, Todd, one of the only other few uh, liberals I enjoy discussing politics with, besides, besides you, of course, uh, he, he, loves the, he loves the word dummies. I'm going to have to ask him if he picked that up from, from uh And you know, folks, I've been banned from Facebook for using <laughs> the word fucking dummy. Ridiculous. That's like Johnny. That's like Johnny Fever getting kicked off the air for saying booger. Booger, I know. <laughs> okay, here's a here's a honorable mention for me. Uh, you know, we've talked about other events where you buy a ticket and you get excited and you go. I've been to several Rend Fests in my time, and when I was uh, Ren the Renaissance Festival, uh, and when I was pulling out my tickets, I just found a couple cool looking tickets. So that's the only reason I bring these up. Here's one from the New York Renaissance Festival. All right, and um, here is one from the Arizona 
Renaissance Fest. So there you Very go. Nice. Yes, I get my geek on. I like to go eat my big turkey leg and I'm not I'm not hey, I, I got nothing wrong with turkey legs. Uh what about Lionel Richie? I have not seen Lionel Richie. Yeah, yeah that guy can dance on the ceiling all night long. I'm telling you right now. Uh, fantastic performer. I saw him open for Tina Turner in Columbus with mom and dad. Nice. And, Beautiful. And fantastic show. I mean, uh, he was not only energetic, he was funny. He talked to the crowd, played all the hits. It, uh, hey, you can say what you want about the guy's uh, video for Hello, but uh, still, <laughs> a fantastic performer. And, and you're goddamn right he played Brickhouse. Nice. And, of uh, course, he better. So, uh, Gary, all right, speaking of, uh, wait, our speedwagon, Gary Richrath. Did you see the Gary Richrath show when he played the Newport Music Hall? No, I did not. We mentioned that you mentioned this a couple of uh episodes ago as well. The I intern keeps your job, yeah. <laughs> all right, that's all we're I, I just remember, I just remember her kissing me goodbye as her boyfriend picked her up at the front door. Oh, goodness. All yeah. right, so we are literally at 40 minutes right now. So this, this session is going to run out. Big break. In a second before. We'll be back uh, with more R's on Ticket Stubs. Okay, Kev, we're back. We got a little bit of time left. We, we still got a lot of R's to go. But I, I, know. Do, uh, I did a little show and tell last week with some of my wasteful spending <laughs> on eBay. Dude, I have never, ever seen this before in my entire life now it is definitely not official kiss merchandise <laughs> but i have it, seen i have seen that shot i have seen that shot i want to say in like a you know circus or a hit parade or something you know but uh, well look it's it's the same motorcycle as the pro arts pictures uh but i don't know where it came from the guy that sold it to me doesn't know nothing uh you know <laughs> th th this this could be off some sort of illegal shipment out of a warehouse in jersey that nobody knows about i don't so, know so todd i know you just rolled it back up for but for the people who just listen to the podcast and don't actually watch us on um youtube would you describe the poster all right, so essentially, now, if you're a KISS fan, you'll know from 1977 or so, there was a series of posters, all of which uh, were the members of KISS riding on a motorcycle. And uh, it was shot in who knows where, but it was made by this group called Pro Arts Inc. out of Medina, Ohio. And you can do a little research, uh, look up the Wikipedia. Basically, they, they, were, they were two dudes out of Kent State, dropped out of college and put together a poster company. Uh, <laughs> and they are the ones who were responsible for the 1976 Farrah Fawcett showing off her nipple in the red uh, bathing suit poster. Classic, uh, that, classic, yeah. That's how they made, that's how they made their money. Uh, they lost it about a year later on an Elvis poster and litigation <laughs> into it. So, uh, so the, but they did a few rounds of Kiss posters, one of which was this uh, round of posters uh, on motorcycles. And this particular shot is Gene on the motorcycle with some vampy looking blondie, you know, hussy in a, in a nightgown. Something that would get you a Me from. Too charge today. Something that would get you, you know, I'm sure, you know. Yeah, I look, look, if they paid the model to sit on his lap, where's the crime? <laughs> so, exactly. All right, so that I just had to show that. All right, now let's get right, back. All right, let's give it. Yeah, we got a lot of ours Two still ours. to hear. Okay, yeah. Uh, Rebirth Brass Band. I totally forgot about Rebirth, dude. Okay, if you yeah. New Orleans, folks, you owe it to yourself to be there on a Tuesday night to go to the Maple Leaf Bar, uh, you know, down, to, well, it's not downtown, but, uh, you know, down in New Orleans. And, and go see the Rebirth Brass Band on Tuesday night. Well worth the show, and uh, one of one of the greatest goddamn bands in all the land. So now, I, is that a band? Is that like a? Re, is that a? School me here. Is that a band? Like, have they been around for a long time with like a revolving cast of members, or is absolutely. there like a? Okay, absolutely. It's more. It's more like uh, a New Orleans uh, school of rock. Okay, uh, you you come up through Rebirth, and gotcha. Then, and then form your own band. Such so as something like, like in comedy, like Second City or something like that, like a training so, ground. I, no, I'm not, I'm not sure if I'm right on this, but I'm pretty sure Trombone Shorty may or may not have been a member of Rebirth at one point. Okay, makes uh, sense. Yeah. I know for a fact that Kermit Ruppins was definitely a member of Rebirth. 
And Kermit Ruffins is one of my favorites in the world. There's another R. Kermit Ruffins. <laughs> nice. <Hey>, Kermit Ruffins. <laughs> so, uh, all right. Got, had to throw a little New Orleans love in there. Okay. Uh, now, we talked about comedians earlier with Don Rickles. Okay. On that same show, I saw Joan Rivers. Wow. Todd, what a double bill, man. Yep. You've yep. seen like and you you have seen like we've established during the course of this show that you've seen some really cool double bills in genres. You saw Chuck Berry and Little Richard together. Yeah. You saw um oh who did we say uh, in folk you saw uh, Peter Paul and Mary Mary with Pete Seeger and with Pete Seeger together and now you saw Rickles and Rivers and together. Rivers together. Yeah. Those two legends, two legends. I bow. Uh, I bow to you, sir. I bow. Now th this is not on the same level of comedy, but I've also seen Rita Rudner. Uh, okay. okay. I, I, you know, she she was great at the time. I saw her with Dennis Miller. Who she I had her it. time. She kind of had her time in the spotlight. But look, my 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 favorite joke of hers is uh, when when she's talking about her husband and when she's doing really really annoying things and and she would say sometimes her husband would just look off and stare off into the into the into the space and say and that's why I killed her, Your Honor. <laughs> so yeah, Rita Rudner, uh, right. Run DMC. Run DMC. Yeah. Nice. Rap acts I've seen. I, I never got to see Run. That's nice. Nice. Excellent. I got to see him with Aerosmith. So that was okay. pretty cool. How cool did they come out with Aerosmith and do the. Absolutely. Course, and, course. And, and DMX was there. So not that I, you know, give a shit about DMX. I think you, you mentioned that in our D episode that you saw DMX. So. Uh, sorry. So, yeah. So DMX and Run DMC. That's, that's, that's my rap contributions right there. So, right so we've established that Todd is a closet rap fan. You, you, you like kind of make fun of me for the ice tea, ice cube. And then, but we, but, but you've seen Public Enemy. Now you've Public seen Enemy. DMC and DMX. Yeah. Ah. We see Todd. Todd's rolling in his uh, car, bumping the uh, bumping his uh, his eight tens. <laughs> uh, all right, what, what one more? Rock City, Rock City Angels. I yes, mean, we, we we talked about we, we talked about that, that in our before. Georgia satellites. Yep, yeah, the, the poor the poor guy uh, Bobby poor guy who, lost his grandma. <laughs> yeah, and unfortunately, he has now joined his grandma. So rest in peace, Bobby. So he's much happier now. <laughs> you almost got that spit take right there. Oh. oh, man. All right, so that pretty much takes care of all of my extra R's. I know you got a couple more. Okay. Emily Roth, I think we should just save her van. Yeah, we, we talked about that off air. Uh, so, yeah, we'll go ahead and save our Roth stories. I got right, a few. You, you I got, got a few good more, ones. You got two more R's, so we'll get yes. to the, uh, the big ones. Okay, um, I wanted to mention the Chris Robinson Brotherhood. We were talking about uh, in uh, our uh, – when we were talking about uh, Plant and Page and uh, Jimmy Page specifically – we were talking about how when he toured with the. Don't you uh, want me to write with you? <laughs> right, nah, we're good, yeah. we're good. And you had said that you thought the story was going to be Chris slept with his wife or something, but uh, anyway, I did see Chris Robinson Brotherhood a few times. Uh, either, either that or either that or uh, Jimmy slept with their daughter. More, that's probably more likely the case. <laughs> um, now. A lot of people, you know, Todd, in, in 2000, from 2000, late 2012, almost all the way through to, into 2014, I was unemployed. You know, I, I, uh, I was living the life. That I am now. I was living the life that you're living this summer. And, uh, you know, I had a few, had a few short term uh, gigs, but uh, when I finally, uh, when I finally got hired at the job that I, uh, that I'm at now, uh, gratefully, um, you know, what, you know, a lot of people that have been employed for a couple of years, you know, what do you think? You know, you finally get a job. You think you maybe go to bed early the night before the new job. You know, no, 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 no. I, I went out to see Chris Robinson Brotherhood. Uh, I'm and, going uh, back to work, God damn it. I'm going back with a hangover. <laughs> rest in peace. A, a couple of things about this gig here. If you look at the venue there, the Park Street patio, they have now torn that down uh, for to build some high rises uh, right, right in the freaking middle of the, uh, you know, in the park area in town but uh neil cassell we got to say rest in peace to neil cassell uh from the chris robinson brotherhood and many many other uh acts as well <coughs> and then one other time i saw chris robinson brotherhood is kind of funny we talked about in the leonard skinner episode how i passed out from heat stroke uh with the, at the uh, skinner and heck williams jr concert my sister told that story uh, go back and my ass. go back and check that out i think it was the big hit i had taken right <laughs> before i went down uh, but uh, anyway um we uh, we have mentioned a couple times uh, again before I, we talked about when i went to see uh, steve miller at the uh at the um 
uh, Berman and Beyond Festival in Louisville, and I had told you how Eddie Vedder was really a real headliner that day. Right. Well, the band that played a couple, uh, I think it was a two, two spots before Vedder on his side of the stage was the Chris Robinson Brotherhood, who I was excited to see. But, Todd, they played at like five in the afternoon, and the sun was up at its hottest point, and there was no shade. We had, you know, had, you know grabbed our spot for Vedder, and, you know, we're sitting there all day. I just remember sitting in my – we were allowed to bring in chairs, so that was cool. I was, just remember sitting in my chair with my shirt – pulled up over my head to, to shade myself from the, the beating sun and just kind of watching the show like this. Oh, God. <laughs> that doesn't sound enjoyable. It, it wasn't. <laughs> but I got to spend it was another time I got to see Neil Casale, so rest in peace. But there's my uh, Chris Robinson brotherhood. And then I've got to talk about, uh, I mean, if we got off the R episode that I didn't talk about, one of my all-time favorites. I never uh, got to see this guy. You can look back here on the – let me see. I'm going to turn the thing. If you look right back there on the shelf right there. I can't see. Not with my vision, Kevin. Well, Come on now. Anyway, it's a whole bunch of books by Henry Rollins, like there almost all of his books. Um, For all so, all yeah, I'm – listening on audio. I am a big Rollins fan. I don't got a ton of stories or anything, but – just ever meet him? Um – never met him. I do have a signed book, but that's because it was already signed at the merch book booth. Um, let's see here. Never saw him with Black Flag? No, I remember him playing with Black Flag at Stashes back in the day, but I still hadn't quite discovered them. I first saw him, look at that. There's all my Rollins tickets. So you can say I'm a fan. Are, now, are, are those actual Rollins shows, or is that also including spoken word gigs? There are Most of these are spoken words. I do have a couple band gigs with both um, with both uh, lineups of the band. He, he totally reformed the band in uh, 2001, and, uh, or no, in 1999. And it was kind of funny because uh, initially he built it as, um, he built it as a, like a, I'm just going to be jamming with this band, Mother Superior, you know, like a new project. But then whenever they actually went on tour, of course, they built it as Rollins Band because who wants to buy a ticket to Mother Superior? You know, Henry Rollins with Mother Superior. So anyway, but it was kind of cool. He walked out on stage on that night and said, hey, I want to thank you all for coming here tonight to hear a whole bunch of songs that you've never heard before. He didn't play any, you know, there was no Black Flag or no, no Rollins classics that night. It was like the whole new album with the new band. And, yeah, kind of rocked, but uh, I also remember him throwing a bunch of... worse than Neil Young doing that goddamn <laughs> play on stage, I'll tell you that. A little more aggression than the Rollins uh, new material. Um, you would like this, Todd, though. He threw a bunch of white power idiots out of the fucking uh, show that night. But uh, here's my first Rollins... Uh, were, they, were they from the villages? <laughs> it was Cincinnati, same thing, maybe? I don't know. Hey, look, we got a lot of transplants from Ohio people <laughs> down here. I know. This was my first Rollins spoken word show um, at the Newport in 1993. It was in March of 1993, and we got in a big snowstorm that night. I remember today they would probably cancel the flipping show, but I just remember... I trudged uphill in snow two ways to see Henry Rollins do hey, spoken word tour. Here's one from uh, Phoenix. Hey, dude, I you know I drove to Sil Silver Spring, Maryland, to see the debut of the Drive By Truckers uh, documentary movie uh, from from Pennsylvania. So this one's kind of funny. Uh, he uh, we we have made fun of the Newport ourselves a couple times on this show about the backstage and how shitty it is. You would have loved this show, Todd. This is from a gig he did at Mecca, which was a short-lived club down in the I Arena District. That place. Uh, he walked out on stage, and it was kind of a cool, trendier, more like a trendier spot. But I wouldn't have personally considered it an upgrade for the Newport. But I, I guess maybe the backstage area must have been because his his opening his opening salvo was all right. It's good to see you all. It's it's nice to have graduated from the confines of the Newport Music Hall. <laughs> and then he proceeded to tell like a ten minute opening story about how shitty the backstage area is in the Newport and he kind of tied it into like a a bit he a, a long-standing bit he has about backstage areas with all the you know graffiti of other yeah. bands and shit you know so that was pretty cool um saw him several times in 99 looks like I was on a tear saw him in Cincinnati drove up to uh uh Detroit to see him I remember this was one of early show me and Heather road trip for place called clutch cargoes it was an old church that's kind of cool you know uh rollins said that was the only way you could get him into church 
was a joke, Jack. Yeah. <laughs> Another Newport show. He had to go back to the Newport after uh, bragging about graduating from the confines of the Newport. He had to go back a hey, few more. That's times. what you get for making fun of it. <laughs> <laughs> what, what were we talking about the Newport? Uh, I think last week. Sometimes on the Newport, you're on your way up. And sometimes at the Newport, you're on your way down. And uh, then here's a couple more with the spoken word. Uh, saw this one again at the Lifestyles Community uh, Pavilion. So he actually, he got to graduate up from the... Right, right before my birthday. And then last year, who would have thought, Todd, years ago, this reminds me of Betty White when she hosted Saturday Night Live and she was talking about Facebook. She's like, we used to... Uh, you know, it used to be torture for us to have to look at people's, uh, you know, slide travel slides from their vacations. You know, now people post it on there. You know, it's like, well, Henry Rollins, how many people could do a tour? It's the Henry Rollins travel slideshow. He literally stood on stage with a clicker and clicked through fo great photographs that he took himself on his travels, and then he told stories about them. I guess kind of like what we're doing right now. I'd go see that. It was great. It was awesome. But I will say this, Henry's uh, starting to show his age. He was not looking like the vigorous, vibrant man that, uh, you know, he He's was. He's got the punch. No, it wasn't that. He's very skinny, very, uh, you know, very, just looking very, very old, you know. Henry. Really? Yeah. Um, I saw there's a funny meme that goes around with him and Ian McKay from uh, Bugazi. It says, punk rock's not dead. It's just much older and going to bed much earlier. <laughs> As so we anyway, all are. So uh, that's that's Think my love affair with your old rock and rollers. Uh... <laughs> uh, da, 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 da. I had to choose between two shirts to wear tonight since we were doing both of these bands in the same segment. I had to, so I did not wear my I, Rolling Stones shirt tonight. Shirt is stuck in the closet somewhere, dude. I, <laughs> I've got I've got a boatload of rock shirts that are in my parents' closet in a suitcase, and I'm not digging it out for this show. Sorry, I got a great Stone shirt that I wear a lot, uh, but uh, I actually went with uh, our our headliner for the night. But uh, let's talk about the Rolling Stones, man. Um, were you into the Stones in school in high school, like? Yeah, as well. I mean, I tell you what, I was never a big Beatles fan. Okay, I was going to say Stones or Beatles. Yeah, for sure the Stones. Okay. Uh, and for me, it was when I remember I remember getting a double record, the story of the Stones, it was some cheap KTEL ripoff, you know, kind of thing. But uh, but it, it, it covered a good bit from you know sixty four to you know sixty nine, right. and uh, and really you know uh, that's uh, a g good chunk of their you know their catalog. Right good there. stuff so, right there, yeah, for sure. So yeah, so from there, then then, then I, that led me to you know Sticky Fingers, Exile on Main Street, and et cetera, et cetera. You know, some girls. But pretty, I, my first Stones record I bought was actually um, the one with Start Me Up. Okay, uh, yeah, yeah, that was mine too. Tattoo you. Yep, yep, absolutely. So that was that was when 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 they hit with the Start Me Up in '82. I was about seventh grade. Okay. And, uh, and I and I I think that's what kind of started it, and then mm -hmm. I went, worked backwards. And uh, one of the and first, uh, actually, but about the time when I when I kind of started to listen to the Beatles, finally, one of uh, the first um, basement parties I remember. My best friend Dave Langship had a party at like his big rec room, and his him and his his parents built like a newer home when we were in junior high, and you know he of course became like kind of you know came, came party a, a party place exactly. But I remember the first one. I mean, I, was just, I guess you always remember your first time. But I just remember uh, Tattoo You was uh, brand new at the time, so that was the hot record for sure. Mm. I saw a band here in town a few years ago, uh, a band called the Rolling Homes. Uh, it was a, a family called the Holmes family, literally. is this um, a guy uh, who's been in a lot of bands, you know, played with a lot of bands locally. But it was his whole family, literally, his wife, kids, everybody. And they played the entire Tattoo You album in its entirety. They actually played uh, songs live that the Stones you know, never played. Pretty cool, yeah. So, but anyway, uh, so, so when was your first Stone show then? Um, I think you and I saw them on the same tour, the Steel Wheels tour. And you know, I'm, I'm not, I'm not getting out my ticket stub because the asshole ripped it, and uh -huh. the the, there's no Rolling Stone. It just says S at the end, and that's it. That's all I got was the S. Here is mine. I got, I, I got a good story about this. Um, there's mine. Now, did you see him in Cincy? Yeah. I saw him in Cincinnati. The T is for turf. Uh, they stamped that to, uh, you know, show that, uh, you know, I was. Oh, wow. You had, you had on the field. Seats. 
Now, we have mentioned before, um, we talked about this show before in our else because uh, a Living Color opened the show, and I, I have stated, you know, sacrilegiously that I thought they blew away the stones that day. But we'll get to, we'll get to the, how the stones made it up in my heart later. But the good story about that day, um, Tom and, uh, my brother Tom and I, we worked a, um, a summer sales job that year. Um, and uh like anything involving tom i know it's shady so let's go, let's go. <laughs> yeah it was great well anyway uh so uh we were able to go early in the day to the show and uh you know we had procured some uh, herbal refreshment for the evening um and actually i take this back i went to the show with my cousin andy tom had gone separately and then uh, i rode down was way in. Yeah, yeah, yeah. no 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 we had just rode down from columbus to cincinnati separately after having worked together during the day well, so I get there and uh, we get into the show and Tom informs me that he almost had been arrested outside because uh, he was uh, twisting one up in the uh, car uh, before going in the show. And a guy, he said, this dude just walked up, you know, a jean jacket, total, you know, rocker looking dude, you know, it's like, hey man, you got any of that? You, you know where I could find any blow? And my brother's like, no, nah, I don't fuck around with that shit, but uh, all I got is this weed right here. And the guy's like, all right, step out of the car, you know, fucking like thing. Took all his, he's like, you know, if you want to see the show, you know, cooperate, uh, you know. And so he wrote him a ticket and freaking took all the weed. He got to see the show. So fortunately, I had rode separately. So we were still uh, supplied. I, I thought you were going to tell me it was one of those guys saying, hey, it's the party police. <laughs> <laughs> no, no. I hate those fuckers. Uh, yeah, well, this fuck this guy too. But anyway, uh, so yeah, here's uh, here's the program for the sure. The black I just was. remember. All right, so in '89, the 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 Stones toured on, on steel wheels, and the Who toured on the 20th anniversary of Tommy. Tommy, exactly. And the, now, this was the first the Stones tour. I actually worked at Buzzard's Nest, and it was my job to take the the um, wristbands they were just tickets at that point but you know basically your tickets for the morning that the sh the uh, show went on sale it was my job to deliver the the supply of the of the stubs uh, we'll call them wristbands to each of the other branches in town what well, the branch i knew that we were going to be that my friends were going to be going to i slipped one band out of every series of 10 you know, so I took number 10, then I took number 18, then I took, so the stack looked proper when I delivered it. Fortunately, back then, inventory wasn't as tight as it might be today, but I knew that no matter what number was drawn, we would be within the first 10 people in line, and sure enough, the karma got me back a little bit. I think we were number 10. <laughs> but you know we got good tickets we, we got on the field as you saw i had the turf you know i had right. the uh, had, had the, the teeth yeah we, teeth for turf we were uh we were up in the stands for that and i tell you now here's the difference you see them at riverfront at riverfront yeah okay and same, well, show, same show as me There's and teeth. so teeth. for me it was more about i'm seeing the stones let's get Fucked up. Oh yeah, I love the show. I wouldn't, you know, I didn't come away like fuck the stones or anything Where, like that. Just, whereas the Who was like, all right, I want to smoke some really, really good weed and sit back and watch this shit because it's well, never going to happen again. So, I've got a good story about the Who when we actually well, we'll get, get to that to in, in down the line. But all right, so now, now we so, so we that was that was our first that was our first oh. one. Here, check we, this out. I think check we both out. also saw. At this the hold time. on, hold on, real quick. Now. You showed a live. You showed your kiss alive too last week. Yeah. The middle of when the the gatefold of kiss alive made people our age just fucking you know just love like the idea of a rock concert you know right. all the bombs and everything going off the stage. This right here made me just want to like draw stages and design big stages. Would you freaking look at that? Well, again, we'll we'll get to we'll get to uh, my next story here. Uh, <laughs> speaking of large stages, but okay. uh, before before we do that though, now did you uh, see them again? Did, did you see the Stones again before we saw them together? Just once. Okay, we'll tell that story then, because all right, so then we'll, in, then we'll get around to the show we saw together. Two thousand and three, I want to say. 
Okay. Uh, it was announced that all right, so the Rolling Stones were getting ready for the next tour. They were rehearsing in Toronto as they have done for years. And at that time, they were going through the whole SARS Fest pandemic. Not too unlike what we're going through right now. And the economy was totally shattered. Um, and the Rolling Stones, actually inspired by Justin Timberlake, uh, put together a little uh, benefit show for the good people of Canada to help the economy recover. I mean, what what better way to, uh, to uh, you know, bring people together and to save the economy than jamming 500,000 people together. Right, together, yes. Place. That would be before. like having a big festival this year for COVID, you know, kind of the same thing. But now, before before you get going on that story talk, because I, I know you actually, and I have some props. I have some props from your story. How is How can that happen? Stick around. But I want to skip ahead, and then we'll double back to this show, because I think this show that you're talking about uh, – would be a good segue into our headliner for the evening. All right. But I want to talk about the show that we saw together at Ohio Stadium. You where, are. Uh, we, the Ohio Stadium, uh, where you and I graduated from college together, uh, where we've seen many Buckeyes games, uh, you know, where we've, uh, you know, big, just a, a big part of our lives. Uh, so the Rolling well, Stones came here uh, five years ago now. God, it's been five years. Five years. Uh, in 2015. Now, they have been here a few times. I think they come to the stadium, what, Bridges to Babylon tour and one of the other tours, but whatever. But normally they played, like, nationwide. They, they Well, they have played some arenas, but they've also played the stadium as well. Uh, but just for whatever reason, maybe it was that, you know, maybe it's that, that sour memory of the old show. And I was like, oh, I saw the Stones already. But I just, you know, or maybe the ticket prices were too high, which is probably more the case, being the cheapskate that I am. But that, if you remember – that the day of the show, they had a twenty nine fifty for upper level tickets. You know, as long as they last, get them at the box office. So we're like, oh yeah, we're gonna go to the Stones for thirty bucks. Uh, fuck, we don't have to go sit in the balcony. <laughs> you know, we'll sit wherever we want. Now I know you had better seats, I believe, because we, you were with uh, your friend Jeff. We didn't get them till the day of the show. Okay, I, you... I, I thought I was going to be Mr. Smart Guy. Oh, I'll show you guys how to play this. Oh, we'll get great seats and do that. There was not, there were no scalpers available that day. Now, were, were you, uh, did you walk to the show with me? Do you know this part of the story I'm about to tell? I don't think so, because okay. I was with my friend uh, Jeff. Yeah, Peach, you were, you were and Jeff and, and Tanner. <laughs> shout out to Tanner. So shout out to Tanner, who is now actually uh, just got his first professional job after college. God bless your buddy. He's teaching some music, kid. man. Yep, yep, yep. We, 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 we've mentioned the good kid uh, in a previous episode, and uh, yeah, I wish the best for him. So, yeah, so, so we, I, this, but anyway, this is my third concert with Tanner. So, um, as I was walking, I parked on Neal Avenue, which in Ohio at uh, Ohio State, folks, is about maybe, you know, it could be anywhere from a few blocks to a mile from the stadium, depending on where you park. So it's probably about, you know, a mile away. So we walked all the way down Neal. And as we're approaching Lane Avenue, which is the big thoroughfare, you know, near the stadium where everybody parties for Ohio stadium games, I look, we're, we're crossing through a parking lot of a gas station. And it's right at the corner of Neil and Lane. So a big thoroughfare where maybe some scalpers might be standing to where I had a, a, back in our Ohio stadium or Ohio state episode. I said that I bought a, a $20 scalper ticket right there on that same corner. So as I'm crossing through the parking lot, I look down and I see this, the back of a ticket laying there. And I said, well, that's probably somebody's uh, receipt. You know, if you yeah. go buy tickets, you know, they print the receipt on a, an actual yeah. ticket. And uh, so I figured someone was pulled their tickets out of the envelope, threw down the receipt, went on to the show. So I reached down, pick it up, flip it over. Somebody dropped their ticket. The $75, uh, that's still a cheap ticket for the Stones, but a $75 face value. So there was a free ticket. Uh, then we went and bought uh, one of the 2950 tickets for Heather. And then we met up with you and Jeff and Tanner, and we all sat together on the A deck. And Todd, I say to this day, it might be hyperbole. People laugh at me, whatever. Going from as much as I told that I didn't like the first Stone show, I consider that show that night, Saturday, May 30th, 2015, to be the greatest concert that I've ever seen. 
Really? Dude, if you just remember, 67,000 people in there just singing along to every song. You know, I mean, well, now I just will the say, community, that community vibe, man. It, I, I just And they did hang on Sloopy. Come on, you're watching right, that's, what I, that's what I was going to say. For the first time since 1966, the Rolling Stones played Hang On Sloopy. So I can say I was there for that. Yeah. Now, I... I I hate to say it, but I think I can top this story. Okay. <laughs> so, <laughs> now, That's what we do we, here. Yes. We, we, we've seen, we've seen, we can, we've seen both the shows in 89 and, and in 2015. In 2003, as I was alluding to earlier, during the SARS Fest, the Stones decided they would put on a charity show. Now, at the time, they had already announced a couple gigs with ACDC. Now, ACDC with the Stones, that's a good gig. That's, that's a pretty cool show. So they announced this gig up in Toronto. It's going to be the Stones. It's going to be ACDC. While we're at it, we're in Canada. Let's throw in Rush. And, well, you know, the guess who? They're from Canada, too. Let's throw them on the bill. And like I said, uh, Justin Timberlake kind of had some influence <laughs> in Greece and the wheels here, so we got to give Timberlake a little stage time. And, well, just for fun, we'll have um, the Isley Brothers and a couple other Canadian bands, and we'll have it all hosted by Jim Belushi and uh, Dan Aykroyd doing their best uh, you know, Blues Brothers 2003 routine. Stub have to look a little bit like that. It is exactly like that. Now, that is an actual stub sent to me by my good friend Todd in the mail. Originally, the show was supposed to Along be with some Canadian free. money there. It was not free. <laughs> However, if you look at the ticket stub, you will see ticket prices were $20. 20 bucks to see the Stones, ACDC, Rush, the Guess Who, Justin Timberlake, the Isley Brothers, a few others, and, you know, the Blues Brothers. For 20 bucks, that was well worth the 12 hour drive from Pennsylvania. 25.50 to be exact. Through, you know, and the frisking through the security getting into Canada with a $4 uh, dollar service charge. <laughs> so shout out to my buddy Tommy McDermott and his and his little brother and his uh, girlfriend at the time. Uh, that was that that was that was for me. Pound for pound was probably one of the greatest concerts of all time. Awesome, uh, yeah. What I've been showing you here, folks, and for people that are uh, again just listening to the podcast, Todd and I are good friends. We've been good friends for a long, long time, and we actually we come from a from an older, better time where occasionally we actually pick up a pen and a piece of paper and write each other letters. Mm -hmm. So my, my good friend Todd here sent me this where he, he typed up all the set lists for each of the bands. And, uh, and believe it or not, folks, in a, in a crowd of 500,000 people, I actually had the wherewithal to write down the damn set list <laughs> as they were happening. Now you can just look it up on setlist.fm the next yeah, day. Yeah. And then here's a picture. This was Todd's view from the show. Yeah, uh, looking up at the screen, Alex Lyson. I I saw a good meme. Uh, this will lead us into our headliner. We're gonna have to actually take another break. Uh, it's gonna be an epic episode this time. Um, but I saw a funny meme yesterday, and it's the um, the uh, it's a clip from the movie where Alex and Getty are eating at the restaurant, and the waitress is uh, Getty, Getty, and Alex is egging her on. That's Getty. Oh my God, it's really Getty. So the meme shows them. And it says, you want, Alex, you want my autograph too? it looks like, no, it looks like one of those uh, motivational pest, uh, posters. So, you know, it's the black poster with the big word and then the smaller sentence below it. And right. it shows Alex kind of sitting there with a the smirk on his face. The waitress, like, squeezing between, shoving him out of the way to get her autograph from Getty. And it says, Alex, not nearly as uh, famous as Getty. <laughs> It should say humility at the bottom. Right. So uh, that's going to lead us to our headliner, I think. Uh, take another uh, break, and uh, we'll, we'll be back. back with Rush. 
Or maybe. <laughs> no, I've already got one of those. <laughs> All right, we'll be back here. Never on sleep with a nursing student. <laughs> we'll be back here on Chicken Stubs. All right, would you please welcome home, Rush. Rush, Rush. What can you say about these three fantastic musicians from Canada that hasn't been said before by Dave Grohl? So uh, the, the I, first I, band I loved, at, you'll appreciate this. The first band I loved after Kiss. You know, the, the next band I, I'm that, that really pulled sure, me. I'm not exactly sure when in my timeline of music they, they came into the repertoire, but it was pretty early. And I do remember, um, I you know, I had a, a certain little circle of, of friends in the neighborhood and elementary and middle school high school and you'd go over to their houses and they did not have the you know vinyl selection i did now kevin yours is massive mine was pretty good for back of the day I, in fact I, my mine was considered as good as yours was to the kids in my neighborhood it's not even it's not even close mine is mine's embarrassing but um <laughs> my point being as i would go over to scott chucker's house and one of the few records that I could stand to listen to over and over and over again was uh, the Rush live record, uh, Exit Stage Left. Like I said, they were the first band that I loved after Kiss. And this is because I was still like uh, just into Kiss and Kiss only, but I went to Boy Scout camp for the first time. And, and a kid named Chuck Murray, who actually ended up moving- Is this story gonna end badly? No, it's not gonna end badly. The, I could tell you a bad story about Chuck Murray, but I won't. <laughs> so anyway, he was cranking this album on a jam box. I heard this, woo -hoo 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 -hoo. that's kind of cool. Da -da. Da, 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 and at 2112, I, I was hooked. I was like, oh my God, this band rocks. So, um, Movie Pictures was the album that was out at the time, but of course, um, Exit Stage Left was the live album that came from that tour. But the album, like I said, the, the album that I got because of 2112 and the fact that they played most of it live on this album in its entirety was all the world the stage see I, I had to go backwards for all that i don't i didn't i don't think i got into them until about moving pictures now todd i think i have the ultimate rush geek story here i don't know if you remember when neil peart uh we uh, pa passed away earlier this year which we probably should have started this whole thing with uh by saying uh, Godspeed and, and rest in peace to the professor. But we'll, we'll give him his due uh, later here at the it's, end. That, that doesn't even need to be said. I don't know if you remember the story I wrote for Pencil Store. But uh, back in the 70s, when I was first getting into a rush, there was also kind of a phenomenon. They're still around, but they were more popular back then, a thing called outdoor dramas. We have one here in Ohio called Tecumseh. There's one in Tennessee. I saw uh, it. There's, okay, okay. I did. I've seen it many times. Uh, there's one uh, in North Carolina uh, about the Cherokee that I'm going to actually talk about in our U episode called Into These Hills. But I was into these plays, and, well, I was into the whole concept of 2112. So young, impressionable Kevin talked the neighborhood kids into putting on a show, and we performed 2112 for our parents. We, we basically just played the record on a jam box and ran around and acted it out the story as we thought it was. I remember we wore long t-shirts of our dad's for tunics to be like- I was gonna say you should have like some robes. <laughs> kind of, kind of. I remember a Rubik's cube was our temple of syrinx. We put it up on the, the like the backyard barbecue. They had one of those old 70s stone barbecues in a backyard. We put the Rubik's cube up and we like, worshipped it as the temple of syrinx uh my brother tom and one of the other neighborhood kids uh, robbie mcquay they were in charge of the pyrotechnics uh they they lit the smoke bombs off uh, a little too close to our parents seats uh, a few may have been lit off under our parents uh, seats uh, it's it a wonderful production time that uh, you would have been proud of me yeah. I, I made a libretto and everything i wish i had that to show here today i don't know how i didn't I, one of the parents probably kept the only copy out there and could blackmail well, it'll be worth millions someday i'm sure 
Yes, whenever ticket when the ticket stubs becomes a uh, you know billion dollar franchise, then that that'll be like finding the Gene Simmons poster with the slutty blonde girl. Uh, you know, you know, it'll be like that. It'll it'll be like Rosebud. So uh, uh, when did you uh, finally get to see Rush for the first time? First first tour was uh, moving uh, the uh, um, power windows. Okay, now you did say going. you wanted to start at, you did say you wanted to go backwards, so I'll let you, I'll, I'll take you no, back. No, there. I mean, we, we, can, we can go that way, that's fine. Uh, uh, so, power, now, Dad, Dad can finish up this story later. He's watching the Dodgers right now. So ah, okay. okay. They're, they're tied in the sixth, we can finish the story tomorrow. <laughs> but, uh, but anyhow, so me and Dad, and he had to drive, because at that point I'd already lost my driver's license at 17. <laughs> so, so, Dad drove to Philly, uh, thank God. You know, this was not the magic bus. Dad had to actually drive his own car and probably had to pay for parking, uh, you know, and drove, you know, drove us down to Philly. Now, he bought the tickets as a birthday present. And I, I God bless him. And, you know, parents don't always know how to buy tickets. They don't know how to shop or how to, you know, look for the best. Seat. They just kind of say, I need two. <laughs> and they trust the computer, and whatever they get is what they take, you know. Now, we ended up with two seats, I swear to Christ, at the top of the spectrum in Philly. I, we were two rows from the ceiling. I could, touch, I could touch the top of the fucking spectrum from my chair, all right? So, now, again, Dad, Dad, can, Dad can tell the whole story, but... Uh, <laughs> Needless to say, Blue Oyster Cult was the opening band, and we discussed this, I believe, in the B episode. And so we we sat in, you know, pretty decent seats for BOC. Okay. You know, we got about maybe thirty rows up the aisle on our way to our actual seats, and Dad said, "I've had enough. We're we're sitting here." <laughs> so we <laughs> sat in some seats for BOC, had a rock and good time, you know. After the set was over, you know, lights come up. Now more people start pouring in. And the people that actually had the seats that we were sitting in were there now. <laughs> you know, and I, I was about, I don't know, 16, 17. Not, not a scrapper in mm -hmm. any way, shape, or form. And these guys were at least 18 or 19, definitely taller than me. And, again, we're in Philly, so I don't really want to fuck with anybody out of town. <laughs> so... I'm ready to just get up and go, hey, fellas, here's your seats. We'll, you know, we'll be moving along. Dad, <laughs> Abe, honest Abe. Now, my father is known for being the most honest man I've ever known in my entire life. He is at honest to a fault. However, in this case, <laughs> Dad says to the two guys, let me see your tickets. <laughs> I'm like, Dad, these are not our seats. He says, I know they're not our seats. Just hold on for a second. So <laughs> they're getting their tickets out. And, you know, of course, Dad's trying to play it off as the gimpy old man. And, uh, you know, and <laughs> so, boy, you know, poor Dad, we had to walk to the top of the goddamn spectrum, you know, for the rest of the Rush show, uh, you know. And, uh, but, uh, you know, God bless him. He tried. He tried his best. So, uh, you know, that, we'll we'll let Dad, we'll let Ted tell his version of the story uh, at a later time. When? What year was that? Eighty six. Eighty six. Okay, so that's the same year that I saw them. One thing you got to talk about when you talk about Rush are the programs, the, the tour programs. Um, the, for real Rush geeks, they were almost like before Neil Peart started writing books. You know, they were like a little. He had like a little book section at the beginning where he talked about the recording of whatever album. And they each had their little gear page. Uh, you know, Getty was always serious. Alex was never serious. And Neil was, you know, kind of, you know, serious too. But then he had, you know, all his little pro thing. But so I purchased, you know, a program for each tour. But on our 30 tour, they actually sold this sweet book. Wow. Which included every. You know, I I never invested in that kind. Of, I I think I might have a couple T-shirts. I think I'm. I well, what what concert programs I did have got lost. So there LA. is the. So there is. The I power. have that one. That's the Power Windows program. That's what I was going to say. That's why I have it in this book. Uh, when I got when I got this book, I did a 
I did a solid to one of my friends. I gave him all of my individual programs that I had at that time. But uh, there's the you there's give the them stuff. to me. <laughs> Not yet, yeah. There, you probably had them already. You went to the same shows as I did. There's, I don't know. Uh, I, 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 yeah, but I never bought the programs. I spent too much money on beer. Now, Todd, they, they say you, there's a lot that's always made about how Rush doesn't really attract a lot of women to the shows and stuff like that. But I can honestly say this. I'm not just making this up. The first time I ever made out with a stranger, like a girl that was a stranger that I just met somewhere and, you know, whatever, we, we felt that old attraction. Was that, a, was you, that the Rush show? Was are it? you sure it was a girl? <laughs> uh, this, it was 40 or 30 yeah, years check ago. Check the so hands was, and Adam's apple. That's all I want to know. I don't know. Anyway. The, the the ladies restroom line must not might not have been long, but uh, I met a friendly girl that evening. Thank you for um, you know being friendly. To Kevin, me. look, I, I, now, you he, always did better with the ladies than I did. Trust me, I I I, I guarantee that story is accurate. I'm just saying, I was just you know. Okay, so then that brings us that brings us to my second show, which was the Hold Your Fire tour, which you began to speak about here. Um. Now, Todd, we, we took a road trip for that show. Uh, we talked Nate. about it last week with Jim yeah. Brown. It was, well, as we were on, uh, yeah, as we were doing our outro, uh, but, but on the way down, uh, the, we, we saw a flaming car. Let me tell you kinda, some folks. Set the mood for the uh, weekend there. First of all, now, I, I, was, I was riding in the backseat of, of Kevin's old, what was it, 64 Plymouth? I don't know what it was. Uh, uh, Fairlane. Uh, Fairlane. 67 Ford Fairlane. Thank you very much. And uh, him, him, and, him and Jim Brown are in the front seat just cranking their death metal. The evil which, wizard? Yes. Which I was not into. Black Sabbath scared me at that point. <laughs> I, didn't, I didn't really like heavy metal to that extreme. Uh, but so anyhow, so we, we had, there was a lot of beverage. You know, refreshments being passed around the car from the drive from Columbus to Dayton. And uh, when, when we saw the flaming car, I wasn't sure if that was a hallucination or if that was actually happening at the time. So that that's the way the weekend started. Yes, it, it happened. It happened. But I remember Tommy Shaw was supposed to open that show, and he, he backed out for some reason. Yep. So that was the first evening with Russ show that I ever saw. Now, we actually saw them twice on the next tour together. And, we, and, and, and together. why is that, Kevin? Well, the first time, uh, we, we've talked about this back in F or K. I don't know. I think it was no, in Jeff. F. Uh, well, no, no. Oh, no, no, no. I'm talking about uh, I was supposed to go. See, I wanted to go see Ace Freely. At the uh, Newport, uh, and and Todd, my old buddy Todd, gives me a call the night before. Says, "Hey, uh, why don't you uh, drive down to Cincinnati and see Rush? I don't know if you had. Uh, let me look at these tickets here. Because um, we, we saw Rush in they, co in Columbus. They're, they're not freebies. Yeah, no, but we saw Rush in Columbus later. The next, uh, we saw them later that summer because I've got the dates right here. The Cincy show is actually first, so that's why you were like, we gotta go." We got to go see Rush. We didn't know the Cooper Stadium again. They didn't announce shows that far in advance back then. Maybe two months in advance. So probably, I bet the Cooper Stadium show, which was in June, was announced right after we drove to Cincinnati to see them. You know, but, but again, anyway, you know, I'm sure we saw Ace Freely like four months later at the <laughs> Al Rosa Villa. Anyhow, so I just remember you called me the night before, and it, this was Todd's entire sales push. You got to go see Rush. But, but, Todd, it's Ace Freely, Kiss. You got to go see Rush. You got to see Rush. You, you convinced me. So we went and saw him there. And then the, later that summer, they came to. And, oh, they, they, that was with Mr. Big, wasn't it? Coop, yes, it was. Cooper yeah. Stadium. There it is. There's the old Cooper Stadium where the Clippers, Columbus Clippers, uh, minor league baseball team, used to play. I think Presto was one of their best records, me personally. I, that's one of my favorites. Now we got to give a shout out to a friend of ours named Jeff Starr when we talked about this show. If you remember, he was uh, managing a Buzzer's Nest Records at the time, and uh, the morning of the on sale, the ticket on sale, you know, he, he would occasionally, you know, pull tickets for friends. So I told him, I said, "Hey, uh, I need four tickets together because there was a group of four that I had money for. I don't know why you weren't in that group. Perhaps you didn't have the money at the time or whatever. Anyway, there was a group of four friends." Shout out to Doug Sexton, buddy Jamie McClinic, and buddy Tim Yee. Uh, we were we were in a group of four, and then I needed two other seats for you and our friend Suzanne. 
And um, I think I, I went with Phil and Annette. So I, did I you? Know. Okay. Well, I had two other tickets. I'm pretty sure that you. I think you moved down to the seats near Suzanne because the the pictures I have, which were taken by you, are from a vantage point that is not where I'm getting to. Anyway, so that morning of the on sale, tickets all went on sale. I knew my buddy Jeff had me covered. I didn't bother even going waiting in line or anything. So I go out that afternoon to pick up the tickets, and he looked at me and he said, um, so you needed uh, two sets, right? A set of four, a set of two. I said, yeah. He goes, all right, I have here your set of two here, and they're right here in the 10th row, and they're over by, like, on the Getty side, kind of off to one side. Good seats, you know? I was like, dude, that rocks, you know? And he's like, the um, set of four, I'm really sorry, but um, – they're right here, and he points to the map. Second row, right in front of Alex. <laughs> Me and Doug Sexton were the only two long hairs, I think, anywhere in sight at that show. And I just remember Alex would come up to the end of the stage, you know, just, you know give us the high side. I'm rock surprised out. that I didn't sneak down with you guys at some point in that show. I'm really surprised. What I do remember is I snuck back with you because, again, uh, we've talked about, you talked about this being in the front row for Ozzy. You can't always party properly you'd and like to. wear in the front row or the second row. You know, when you've got a big bouncer literally standing right in front of you, looking right at you. So I think I snuck back. For some reason, I remember you coming down to the 10th row tickets, even if you went with Phil and that. Maybe your seats were in that range as well because I came back with you and um, you took some of these. Again, famous examples of the 80s, 90s pictures, folks. Uh Yep, yep. There's a great shot of all the people in front of you and a yep, small all shot of Rush. Let's see, what do we got here? Uh, here's you know, that all can be cropped now. So yeah, yeah. Exactly. I can scan these and crop them, but it's just funnier to show them this way. <laughs> and there's Alex and Getty rocking out. See that? Yeah, you'll have to send those to me for yeah. the book. <laughs> you don't have them anymore, huh? Uh, I never the had them. Those are the good ones. Now, the cool thing about I that... I you those? Yeah. Yeah, you, you gave me these. It's, I don't know. Maybe maybe these were mine, and I just took them back by you. But anyway, I've had these wow. for years. Now, what's cool, Rush, all we, in, their, in the programs that we talked about, I kind of set this up for later, um, they always, the live shots in the program were always from the tour before. So on the next tour, when I was living up in Rochester, New York, I actually went to see them in Buffalo and drove over from Rochester. It was a, a Huge snowstorm hit that night, Todd. We literally came out of the show and uh, had to wait while the uh, snowplows dug our cars out of the parking lot. I think, you know, we had to wait like three hours after the show. But I buy the program and I, it, uh, for the uh, Rolling Bones tour. I'm getting somewhere with this. Just, just be patient. Uh, and I start looking through the program. And boom, right there, opening shot, Cooper Stadium. Uh, stage set up. Also, some shots later on in there. I won't show them, but uh, of them doing sound check to the empty stadium uh, are from there. So that was kind of cool. Like, hey, I was at that show. So, uh, when else? Uh, what other times have you seen Rush? Uh gosh, let's see. So we saw them together on the Counterparts tour up in Cleveland. I recall, yep. but that was on a, like a four-day bender. I he saw, uh, like, talked about this with Pearl Jam. Uh, I, I, I did the check. We actually did see Pearl Jam the night before, March 22nd of 94. And then and I, I, I had seen two dead shows back to back before that. So I, I was I was pretty tired. We had went back for Rush the very next day. By the time Rush Did came better, around. Better view of that. Uh, uh, there's the see. program for that. Counterparts. Now, uh, the Oh. We saw them a couple times on the 30th anniversary tour. I saw them in uh, Phoenix uh, right after I broke up with my – right after I, I went through the big uh, breakup out there. Uh, I, I paid my buddy Jimmy Gloss to drive me from Tempe into Phoenix. I bought his ticket and bought his gas to go see them on the Test for Echo tour. I saw that in 96. I saw that in New Orleans uh, by myself. That, that was the year they played all of 2112, correct? Yes, the only time they ever played the entire thing because even on the 2112 tour itself, and then they did it again later, they had left out like a song or two. Now, a lot of Rush, a lot of non-Rush fans don't realize that Rush almost, their career almost ended after that tour. 
because of uh, Neil. No, so, didn't get to make that record. Well, no, uh, they made the record, but after the tour was over, um, before the next, before they ever even talked about, you know, a next record, uh, Neil's wife or Neil's daughter and wife both were. His daughter was killed in a car accident, and his wife died of cancer uh, about nine months later. So at that point, Rush was done. Neil actually wrote a book about it, which is a freaking awesome book. Really helped me a lot when my dad uh, was killed. Uh, it's called Ghost Rider. Now, we're not all as rich as Neil Peart, but if anybody has read the book or you haven't read the book or you don't know, this is how Neil got over those tragedies in his life. He went out and got on his motorcycle, and he just rode. It ended up being something like 44,000 miles. He rode all the way to the across Canada from Montreal to the Arctic Circle down into the you know southwest of the united states all over the desert um down into mexico all the way to belize left his bike down there for winter and went back and rode back and you know slowly got over it ended up meeting his new wife uh you know at the time uh and ended up having another little girl poetically who you know unfortunately did lose him this year when she was just 10 years old. So I, I hope she, uh, you know, she obviously has a, a great legacy, you know, from her dad, uh, you know, to, to, to live by. All right, and we saw him again uh, together on the Vapor Tour, the Vapor Trails Tour, when they actually came back uh, from Neil's tragedies. Uh, right. If you you kind of referenced my boss's uh, daughter. Uh, shout out, uh, VB out there. Uh, she had a seventh row ticket. Uh, that we were all taking turns. Oh, I do uh, remember that it. now. Ah, that was <laughs> I remember when it was my turn. It was right as soon as Neil was starting the drum solo. It was like, yes, all right. I mean, you know, if you're going to be down front for one part in a rush concert, you know, the drum solo. Was it's a good part to be there for. Mm -hmm. It's always um, nice and sharing tickets. The last time I saw Rush at um, the German Amphitheater, my sister was working the uh, beer booths. And... Uh, she put Heather and I on the work list as employees. So we literally got to go to the back gate and check in. We didn't have to work. We literally, she just let us walk right through the booth and then out onto the lawn. So shout out, Terry, sis, love you. Got to walk right by Neil's bikes and everything in the back. Um, my, uh, my nephew and uh, his uh, wife, uh, they mentioned like, oh yeah, him and all his buddies uh, rode in, you know, about an hour ago. They got to see him all ride up and everything, you know, around sound check time and stuff. So that's pretty cool, but uh, I love and then, this oh, and then one time uh, for the time machine tour, you'll love this. I think you remember when this happened. I actually won tickets uh, from QFM ninety six. Uh, our old buddy Archie uh, in the morning. Archie, Archie uh, he had a question one morning. He's like, Getty Lee is not Getty's real name. Wh whose name is it? Literally. Heather Gattery. picked up the phone at work and called me and said, you've got to call in there. I just asked what Getty Lee's real name is. I called immediately. Boom, exactly. And I said it was Gary. Now, uh, do you know why he's Getty? Well, because his grandmother, who has a very thick accent, used to say Getty. Getty. Exactly. His, his, with her very thick Hungarian Yiddish accent. That was the next question Archie asked me. But anyway, because I knew that little bit of geekdom, I won tickets for that show, so that was awesome. Uh, the next show after that would have been the uh, Clockwork Angels tour, where they completely pissed off all the uh, heavier, uh, more uh, metal uh, era Rush fans and decided this time we're going to play, an in besides playing the entire new album, we're going to play an entire set of our 80s synth songs. Although there, there was one good 80s edition in there which was from uh presto so okay. uh, you know. but, well yeah, i mean that, that was that was miserable i if, if they had ended with that tour i would have been pissed yeah they almost did you know that tour was supposed to be the I, final I know. Story, you know I so, so thank god for alex and his uh, rheumatoid arthritis because thank that's god. that's what uh, he he said uh you know I, I can only do one more if i if i do one more so so neil acquiesced and they did one last tour, the R40 tour. Thank God. That was, and and who who goes out and does their best show ever on their final tour? I mean, Rush does. Rush does. And and they didn't do any of the bullshit hoopla about 
you know, we're retiring, it's the final tour or whatever. They kind of gave a wink and a nod in that direction, like, you might want to get tickets for this show. And uh, they did the whole backwards in time thing, uh, you know, with the show. That was just really cool. I never well, got to see I tell you, you know, the, the Time Machine tour kind of gave you a little inkling that they were heading towards retirement, I think. Mm -hmm. Oh, absolutely, absolutely. Doing uh, the movie pictures in its entirety, for sure. But, uh, yeah. That and then final... that show, and I, I got I to tell one quick story about okay. that show yeah. before we wrap it up. Uh, yeah. So I went to that show with uh, some friends of mine from Pennsylvania. I was living in PA at the time. My buddy Tommy. My friend Melty, God bless Melty. One of the few, one of the few shows I've ever seen with with Kristen Smelter. So uh, uh, one, one of my high school buddies, who's now a responsible, loving mother uh, and uh, and and wife and parent. So, uh, but anyway, so I, I talked to her to go and see Rush, and uh, and and it was a rainy, miserable day. I, I thought, well, we'll just go to the parking lot and see what we can get in the parking lot. It was just so nasty out. There was nobody out selling tickets, and tickets were like ninety dollars. I'm like, look, worst come to worst, we you know buy the bite the bullet and pay the ninety bucks, get the tickets. And um, so as we're all about ready to walk inside, the four out of five of us, they all start walking in, and, and some guy says to me, "Hey, you need a ticket?" I said, "Well, what do you got?" He said, "I got something in the fourteenth row uh, for forty bucks." Okay, so I gave him 40 bucks for a ticket in the 14th row. This is at Hershey. Now, as I'm making that deal, Melty and Tommy and the other two people, Tim Hooper and some other guy that Melty brought from work, guy was kind of a dork. Uh, should have called him the dork. But uh, so, anyhow, so they're about ready to buy tickets, and the lady says, well, you know what? They just uh, moved the sound booth in the middle and there's an extra row there and so you can have five seats right there so they got four tickets for themselves and one for me so i had two tickets to the rush show one in the 14th row and one in row q back by the soundboard so i you know i was in hog heaven brother my only thing was before I went to the show, I really should have checked the battery power on my camera because I took one picture and it went dead. Uh, so I was like, in the 14th. I was in the 14th row. It was old, so it's like old. School. No juice oh, in the camera. Dude, that sucks. Yeah. You know? <laughs> oh yeah. So that was. That Here's that Clockwork Angels tour. Uh, when we, I remember walking out and the guys behind us complaining like, oh my God, I can't believe they played all the Angels. I went to that by myself. I had an extra. I sold it for 40 in the parking lot in Philly because no one else wanted it. I mean, uh, it, that was sad. Now, the, let's, let's go to the last show and let's wrap yeah. this sucker up because we've yeah. been talking for about three hours now. Yeah, exactly. This could be like our longest episode ever, but uh, we'll, we'll, we'll talk about what potentially could be a very long episode next week. But, um, here it is, R40. Um, like yeah, we, how much did you pay for your tickets? Uh, let's see what we got here. Um, well, that's a zero value ticket, so I'm not sure. I think I bought is it out. No, it, it is a comp, but I probably bought it outside for, I would say, under $50 if I bought it outside. I can't remember the specific story of buying the ticket. Like I said, I was just so in, you know, I was so in wrapped. All I had so. was 20 bucks. Okay. I had twenty dollars. Okay. And you and Heather had already gone inside. Yep. Yeah, yep. Yeah. You had your tickets, mm -hmm. and you said, "If you get lucky, text us when you get inside." Yeah. Okay. I remember that. So I was literally walking around the Jean Fang Center with my twenty-dollar bill, saying, "I am a Rush fan. I have seen every tour since Power Windows." All I have is twenty dollars. Someone, please help a Rush fan get into this. I, I walked around for an hour and a half doing that bullshit. Brother, can you spare a Rush ticket? Finally, finally, a brother comes up and says, "Do you seriously only have twenty dollars?" Which was not necessarily. I had, tw I had an extra twenty for beer, but I, <laughs> I had twenty for the ticket. You got yeah. You got to hold some beer money, right? Right. And I said, yeah, that's all I got. He said, come on. 
and and we walked in together and i was so happy so you want to give me a hug i said yes i do yes, yes i do yeah, and I, I, don't, I didn't keep the text but i remember texting you going kevin i'm in for 20 bucks where are you <laughs> and i i remember sitting up in my seat for a little while and uh and oddly enough i was sitting next to uh the woman that uh hired and fired me from my temp job at uh at manpower uh uh, and then I found you, and we sat for the rest of the show, and 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 that was that was the last time that we got to see. We I'm so glad we got to see our last rush show together, buddy. Me too. Me so, too. Uh, you know, Cheers. I, I, I couldn't think. I couldn't think of anybody else. I would want to go see my last rush show with the Gamecube Pal because uh, we we've been to so many together, and uh, they they've yeah. been they've been a meaningful group to both of our lives. I think. Absolutely, absolutely. And um, as we kind of wrap it up here, uh, just to uh, show a few more trinkets here, we could... Uh, Thank every, God, because I need another cigarette. Every, here, here you go. This is an invaluable resource for you, Todd, um, as you write your rush stories for the book. Um, I got this book for Christmas last year. Um, I need to see that one. Wandering the Face of the Earth. Look how thick this mother is. Dude, that, that's what Ticket Stub is going to look like when I get done with it. Anyway, this is every Rush gig ever. We could look up the facts for each show we uh, talk about Columbus tonight and Ohio, see how well we were. 1974, Vets Memorial, when they opened for Kiss. And it's people threw tomatoes at them. Actually, not even Vets Memorial, the Agora. Some of the most famous pictures of Rush from that tour are on that Newport stage with this red carpet. And it, the, it was painted white, you know, the black, what's black behind the stage now. Well, they they you, opened for Rush at Vets. They I opened. Open they open for. They may have come back at Vets, but they opened for Kiss at the Agora in 1974. Whenever the first tour, there's, really? there's there's plenty of pictures of both bands playing on the Newport stage. Trust wow. me. But uh, before we wrap up uh, to talk about Rush, we have to talk about the Professor. Obviously, yeah. uh, you know, you did an episode of What the Hell Was That uh, for Memorial Day this year, where you uh, pretty much. Pretty much to everybody who's died in the last uh, seventy since, years. Yeah, since Hank, well, you started with Hank Williams, and you just rolled right on up to the present time. And then we we kind of talked about the professor at the end. But um, Neil Peart did, of course, pass away in January of this year, and the whole world's gone to shit since. I think we can agree on that. But uh, here's a cool real picture I want to share of him. This is how I kind of would like to remember the guy. Look at him. Dressed I up like in to his... remember him with his big bushy mustache. Yeah, there you go. Look, he's dressed up in his old kimono. That's probably for the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame. Whenever the um, what uh, the Foo Fighters guys, you know, dressed up as Rush and played Twenty One Twelve. Now I've told you before that I I've met Taylor Hawkins uh, at the Rainbow Bar and Grill mm -hmm, in mm -hmm. Hollywood. Right. And the, the one thing I wish I had said to Taylor was, you know. From one Rush fan to another, I can appreciate everything you've done and said for that band. Uh, you know, <laughs> because uh, they, they, they're they're truly just as much. Dude, those guys are as hardcore Rush fans as we are, brother. Oh, absolutely. And I mean that uh, that was a great. Uh, I mean, their, their uh, induction of Rush was great. Fantastic was tribute. Yeah, yeah. So yeah. Yeah. hats off to Taylor. Hats off to Taylor and Dave. Uh, you know, uh, for, for, other, for being the true Rush fans that you are. Some other Neil books here. There's one called Roadshow. This is about the, um, this is actually about the Test for Echo tour because that's the first tour he rode around on his motorcycle. But look at that cover shot there from Red Rocks. You ever see a shot at Red Rocks, Todd? I've seen the drive-by truckers at Red Rocks. Yeah, all right. Well, dang on it. Uh, there's one called Far Near. He did three of these books, which are really about all his travels and stuff. But I just I, I miss the guy. Well, folks, in, in honor in honor of Neil, uh, I gotta say, pr pr and probably and probably my favorite are out of the R's. Uh, you know, God bless Rush. Uh, I, again, Rush, like the Ramones, like many others, are just bands that if you didn't get to see them, I feel sorry for you because you're never gonna get to see it again. And if you don't know what it was like, you truly miss something good. So uh, you know. One of the things I'm looking forward to next year, Todd, when all this craziness is over and we can gather again and go to concerts, I still got those sitting tickets that I showed in our P episode to Primus plays 
all of uh, Farewell to King. So, well, I, I, you know, if it, if it ever happens, I'll, I might go along with you, pal. Right on, cool. So, uh, Todd, uh, next week, uh, next week's gonna be even longer than this week for Christ's sake. You gotta, dude, like, what are we gonna, what are we gonna do next week? I alone, I gotta show you this. Just, I'm not gonna do the whole rundown now, but I alone have. Look, this is the only. This is the first show. This is the first set of notes I had to staple together. I have look that 57, 57 total bands that start with an S that I have seen. So um, it's going to be a special episode next week. I, I say we just get to do it. Look, you know, not even tell story, just name the fuckers. Here we go. Uh, <laughs> Soraya, Joe Satriani, Boz Skaggs, uh, the Scorpions, uh, the Scrutopians, Scruto Pete Seeger, Bob Seeger. Uh, what else we got? Uh, Brian Setzer, Sean Anna, Sean Anna, Sacred Reich, know. Sanctuary, Santana, uh, Paul Seven Simon. Time. The show's over. Slaughter, <laughs> Feathering, Social Distortion, Soundgarden, Spring.